Good morning. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about right there. Amen. How many of you are glad to be here? And I did remember the clock. How many of you are glad? Yeah, I was going to say, I got a few, so we may be here a while. Amen? So that's what I'm talking about. I got one fan. I just take all day. Okay. Me and you. Feel free to land whenever you need to. <laughs> Woo. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to confess something right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to confess that uh, as we were standing around and kind of getting ready this morning and things, so many people were working so hard, I, I began to see people, you, show up. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if this makes me old or wimpy or emotional, but uh, I had to fight back tears. That's the truth. Because I love you. I do. And there was something, there was something really powerful about us coming back together, even like this. And just so you know, just so you know, um, we're not all here today. <laughs> And that is our reputation in town anyway, man. <laughs> Amen. Some of you are like, man, I haven't seen you in forever. Now you're insulting me. What's up with that? Man. I, uh, man, I tell you what, I've missed you guys. I have. I, I was just telling them, though, after all these weeks of doing it digitally or trying to, uh, it's going to be tough. If right in the middle I just ask for a cut and a retake, you'll understand why. Um, no, real quick, I want to just share some things. I, I want to just... For those, uh, for those of you that don't know, this service is being uh, live, live streamed on Facebook. Um, we, we don't have the ability today to live stream on YouTube, so it will be recorded and then put on. Uh, so for those of you that are here on the grass, we welcome you. For those of you that are in the, in the parking spaces, we welcome you. For those of you that are watching online live right now, which is a good chunk of us, we welcome you. Amen? Uh, we love, I love that we live in a day when we can be united without being in the exact same space. I do. I, I love seeing you, and I love that we're here, and I praise God that you felt like you could be here. But we have a lot of folks that we all are a part of, that we love dearly, that, that didn't feel like, for whatever reason, that they could, not, they could not be here in this setting this soon. And I need you to understand that we are, we are respecting them, we love them, we appreciate them, they're part of us, right? Nothing less. Amen? Nothing less. And if you're here this morning, just so you know, many of you feel like you need to wear masks, we respect that and we love you for that. And if you don't, we respect you and we love you for that. Amen? Uh, we've said as elders, and I still believe that's, I don't know where all the other liabilities lie, but we have really kind of been united in the fact that this is a very personal decision made by each and every person, right? We want to be as safe as we can possibly be. We want to protect you because we believe that's part of shepherding well. But I just want to tell you out loud, we love you. And we respect you. And all I would ask in return, as we always do, is that you also love and respect everyone else who might not agree with you on certain small things. Amen? What might be big to you might not be big to someone else. And those things, child of God, should not divide us. Amen? Amen. They should Amen. not divide us. Um, just real quick, some announcements, some housekeeping. We have, how many of you, well, we'll cover that in a second. We have two, not one, but two places to give this morning. We have the box that you're probably used to seeing over here on this table. If you can see that one, raise your hand. This is where we participate. Amen. <laughs> There's another one right over here. The box is different design, but similar in color. Can you see that one? Yeah. Amen. So if you, I'm going to pray here in a minute. We're going to ask the Lord to bless our tithes and our offerings and our giving, but I need you to know from my heart, um, this is just out of convenience. The truth is, man, you guys have been faithful and I praise God for you. I really do. I've said it on every day I say it on um, I can't explain it, right? Well, I, I do try to stay on the pulse of what's going on across the country and around the world in the body of Christ. And I would tell you, um, we are very, very blessed one to another. Amen? There are, so, there are lots of churches, there are lots of ministries right now that are struggling. And those that would normally be incredibly faithful have lost their jobs, have, have been laid off. Many of you, that applies to. And I would just tell you that in the midst of all this, across the board, God has provided mightily for us as a body. So I thank you for your faithfulness. For those of you that were able to feel like you just followed the Lord's impulse and you gave more to, maybe, maybe you didn't know why, but I would tell you on the surface, on the numbers, it was to help those who were, had been laid off or, or, or cutting back their hours or needing help, amen? So thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. So before you go, if you choose to do it that way rather than digitally, we have the two boxes available. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just want to put in a cheap plug for this. This is amazing, and I love that you're here, and I love being with you, but I want to encourage you again, cheap plug for a small group, right? Whether a small group being two people, or five people, or 10 people, or 20 people, or bigger. I want to encourage you to add that to this. How many of you have heard me say that before? Okay, that's not even close to true. I know you guys, right? I've been saying this for a while. I really want to encourage you. This is serious. Through this season, and it seems like the longer it goes, the more I feel like this is important. Amen? Does that make sense? The more it's important to connect with your brothers and sisters, the more it's important to connect and help one another and help each other grow and help each other stay strong and pray for each other. That rarely happens right before or right after this. It does happen, but it doesn't happen as often as it does in a small group setting. So I want to encourage you, and I'll shut up about that, but I want to encourage you. Please call the office. Find out how many groups are out there. Find out when they meet. Find out how you can get involved. Amen? We good? That was not near the response I was hoping for. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Amen. How many uh, fathers do we have in the house or outside the house today? Amen. Amen. Here's what I'd ask you to do. If you are, I'm looking for the youngest father right now. The youngest father. So if you've got one child or more, but you are the young, how, do we have any 25 year old fathers? Can you raise your hand? 25 or under. Amen. Do we just have one? Winner, amen, that's good. Those will be a pie for you right after the service, amen? <laughs> How about the oldest father? Do we have any fathers that are over 50? How many fathers over 60? Amen. How many fathers over 70? How many fathers over 80? Amen. Do we have any? I see one. Is there others? Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand. And here's the one that's probably the most trying for everybody to answer. The one with the most kids. <laughs> Amen. The most kids. Other than God the Father. Amen. If you're here and you've got four kids, would you raise your hand? Four or more. Amen. If you have five or more, would you raise your hand? Keep it up. If you have six or more, keep it up. If you have seven or more, keep it up. Oh, two of you, six? That's awesome. Give them a hand. Amen. Amen. Now what I'm going to ask you to do is real simple. That was kind of for fun. But if you're here and you're a father, I would ask you to stand up right where you are for just a second. Would you do that for me? Would you join me? Just right where you are. Just stand. I'm going to have you all sing the national. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's what I am going to do. I'm going to ask you to, to grace me with the opportunity to pray for you. Is that okay? I, I, I mean that from my heart. I'm not doing this just because it's this day, but this day always reminds us of this. And I'm going to tell you, our fathers in this country need prayer. Amen? Amen. Our fathers around the world need prayer. So we're going to pray right now for you. Father, thank you. You are the ultimate father in heaven. We, we praise you today out loud. We are gathered in your name to do business with you. And we just thank you right now for these men that are standing and, and able to stand. Lord, we thank you for the fathers in our, in our faith family. We thank you, Lord, because you have raised them up to love you. And that's why they're here. I pray, Lord, for them. I pray a huge blessing from you upon their lives, upon their marriages, upon their home, upon their children. God, before you're done in their life, their entire life and their entire testimony would scream that they are in love with you. God, that they would be courageous not to be opinionated, but to be in love with you, that they would want to share you, that, they, that their testimony and their family, Lord, before it's done, would just beam that you have been there with them through every step of raising kids and, and being married and going on to pass these amazing gifts on to the next generation. I pray your richest blessings on them in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. I, uh, I had a few things I wanted to share this morning. And we're going to read some in the Word, but I want to just kind of share some thoughts with you. This was, this was a, difficult, a difficult one for me. We are still in the Gospel of John. We are still working through the book of John. And I would tell you, getting to this chapter, I had several people ask, well, are you going to preach a Father's Day message? I had others say, are you going to preach short a Father's Day message? Um, how many of you know I struggle with the short? <laughs> Amen. Um, I, I would just tell you, I, I, I struggle because when we get together, listen, I believe that God has got a call for you and a call for me. And part of this is to be able to get together and open up his word and to the best we can possibly do to share his word for us in this generation. Amen. So as a result, listen, it's very difficult for me to do a one and done or three points and out. And I realize that for some that might be normal and it might be okay. But today I pray you didn't come for that. If you did, buckle up. 
<laughs> oh, and there are Bibles. Thank you. Before we get started, we're going to read here in a minute. If you didn't bring one and you want to keep me honest, there's Bibles right there. I was already told this morning by Pastor Luke and others, hey, we don't have the big screen. How are we going to know you're reading out of the Bible? That's why we brought those out. If you need them, somebody will bring them to you or you can grab one on the way. Listen, I would tell you that there's a, an image issue in our culture, in our culture with God the Father. And we're really here to, to, to celebrate fathers that love the Lord, but, but really the extension of that is the reason you're here and the reason your father that loves the Lord is because we're here to honor and glorify our Heavenly Father in heaven. Amen? Amen? But I would tell you it's, this is where it gets a, a rub in our culture a little bit right now. We have an issue, a, 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 an image problem for God. How many of you know God himself has no image problem? But we sometimes get in the way, and it creates an image problem. And here's, here's an example. For instance, I feel like our, our image of God the Father in our culture is more like a tired, cranky, judgmental old man who sits on a cold throne somewhere up beyond the clouds, kind of like Santa Claus, kind of has a list, and he's checking it once or twice daily, hoping to, to disqualify somebody and keep us out of heaven. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There are a lot of us that have had that image of God the Father. If we were being honest, and I'm not asking for you to be at this moment, but if we were being honest, that image of God the Father might be closer to what you're thinking than what we want to admit in church. And I would tell you that that's a problem, and it's a problem on a lot of counts, and here's why. I, I saw a meme of all things here just recently, and it's just it's one of the most, my, probably my favorite of this year so far. And it's basically, it says, it says religion says, I messed up. My dad is going to kill me. How many of you, when you're thinking of your heavenly father in heaven, that's crossed your mind a time or two? Three of us, amen, four, praise the Lord. Next week's on honesty, please come early, amen. <laughs> the rest of that meme says, religion says, I messed up, my dad's gonna kill me. The gospel says, I messed up, I need to call my dad. Yeah. 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 Amen. Is that resonating with anybody? I'm gonna tell you the truth, I, I was so blessed. And I pray, I don't know if my dad's going to be watching live or watching the replay, but I, I was blessed. I was. I was blessed as a kid. I, I didn't do anything to deserve it, but I had a, a dad that loved Jesus. And he raised me to know and fear the Lord and to trust the Lord. And, and so I, I didn't have the excuses that some of us do. I, I, I had a birthright almost. It was like I, the first word I ever spoke, they said, was Jesus. I, was, I don't remember. I'm not that smart. But, but it was just like, I, man, I remember being in my mom's lap and having Bible stories being read to me almost daily. Listen, I, I knew about God before I understand who he even was. I have a great thought. When it came to knowing who the Father in heaven was, I, it was not a stretch for me. Not because my dad, because I knew he had raised me to know that he loved me and guided me and directed me and, yes, disciplined me in love. I, it was not a stretch to think that my Heavenly Father would love me because my Father loved me. Amen? Some of you, many of us in our culture today don't have that. And the longer I pastor, the harder Father's Day is. I come wanting to celebrate all fathers. And every Father's Day, I have many from two to five to ten different people in the course of the week approach me in tears and say, I appreciate that your dad was a great dad that loved the Lord and taught you about the Lord and showed you love and protection. And I get that, but my dad abused me. My dad abandoned me. My dad left me. My dad hurt me. And as a result, this day, listen, is a hard day for some of you. And I need you to know from my heart, we love you. We are here for you. And I appreciate what you've gone through. But you need to hear me. If you don't hear anything else today, you need to hear this. You have a heavenly father in heaven that will never abuse you, never hurt you, never run away from you, never leave you hanging, and he will never orphan you. And some of you right now, you're like, well, that's, that's great, but that's just, that's not what I know. I, I have a hard time with that. Listen, in this culture, unlike any I've ever seen, we have people that are literally wanting and they realize their need for Christ. They realize their need for, for the Spirit's change in their life. They realize there's a lot of things they need. But listen, they run from the Father. They run from the Father. They want salvation. They're, they're like, I like the idea that somebody died for me. I love the idea that, that, that he's willing to even give me his spirit after I say yes. They like all that, but when we say, hey, this all started with the love the Father had for you, the whole thing in their heart and their head shuts off because they can't imagine God the Father being all that we say he is when their relationship with a father, the word father for so many is a broken title. Amen? This is the culture we're living in. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. I would tell you that, that this idea of God being the Father, it, it isn't just a New Testament thing. 
It started in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, 17 different times, best my count is, 17 different times throughout the Old Testament, God is revealing himself over and over and over through his prophets, and it comes out, and they, he's identified as the Father, but it primarily was over the nation of Israel, over his people, amen? Example, two or three real quick. Jeremiah 31 says, Tears of joy will stream down their faces, and I will lead them home with great care. They will walk beside quiet streams and on smooth paths, for they will not stumble, for I am Israel's father. Amen. Amen? Another. Isaiah 63 says, Surely you are still our father. Even Abraham and Jacob would disown us. Lord, you will still be our father. You are our redeemer from ages past. Isaiah 64, last one for the Old Testament, says, says, and yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. Can we just agree that the Old Testament stapled the fact that for Israel, for his people, he was to be identified as a father. That picture of him being the father of a nation was stapled in the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. 17 different times it's, it's covered that way. But I would tell you it didn't stop there. We get to the New Testament and Jesus comes along. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Jesus comes along, and in the New Testament, he brings to life this defining description, this picture, this portrait of God the Father, his Father. He begins to revive that, if you will, in the New Testament. 165 times, in my count, over the four Gospels, Jesus references his Father, God in heaven, as his Father. He references him as, as Father God, or his Father. Or, and listen, and he begins to, and even in our text today, he's going to begin to promote the idea of this crazy notion that not only is he his father in heaven he wants to be your father and he staples that 165 times in the gospel accounts a hundred of those roughly roughly 60 percent of those are recorded in john's gospel and out of those hundred 20 of them are recorded in chapter 14 that we're in today i would tell you that 20, 21 total times the word Father's used in chapter 14. And I would tell you that's more than the references made throughout the entire Old Testament. And that's just in our text today. Can we all agree, before we dive in, can we all agree that it was Jesus' intention to staple? Everybody say staple. It was his intention to staple firmly in our hearts and our minds that he, in fact, had a Father in heaven. It was God, his Father. And absolutely, his father is a good, good father and wants to be your father, too. Amen. Amen? We're going to cover that today. I would just tell you, let's, let's dive in because I, I want to read something. Amen? How many of you are ready to get into the Word? We're in John 14. I, I could just reread the whole thing, but for the sake of time, I'm going to try to hurry. <laughs> Here we go. We're going to pick it up, I think, in verse 6. This is, you're going to say, hey, we covered 6 last week, Pastor. We did, but it, it flows, amen? We're all about being in context, amen? We're all about being in context. Chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had already, if you had really known me, you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip, like us, he said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you don't still, and have I been with you all this time and you don't know who I am? Anyone, he says, who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show, show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? This is so important. Don't miss this. We covered this last week. We're going to cover it briefly now. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth, still Jesus, all read. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Try to, try to stay with the word Father here because he uses it a few times. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it for the Son can bring glory so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, right? In alignment with his will, in his, in his teaching, and I will do it. And in verse 15, he says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, this version calls it, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Man. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now. This is good. He lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. For some of you this morning, that's what you came for. Was there. Amen. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live 
Since I live, you also, you also will live. When I am raised, listen, this is good. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Wish we had a few days on this. This is good. Those who accept my commandments and obey, obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple. Don't you know that would be a horrible name, amen? <laughs> said to him, Lord, why, why, are you going to, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them. And we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone, everybody say anyone. anyone. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. Notice the word Father over and over. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. How many of you could use some peace of mind and heart this morning? Amen. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is the gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you will be happy that I'm going to the Father who is greater than I am. I've told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. Listen, we're almost done. I, I don't have much time to talk, Jesus said to you, because the ruler of the world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. This is arguably one of my favorite passages, if, it's, if there's any that are more potent in a, in a single setting it might be the next chapter so come next week amen we see in this in this chapter it's powerful we see jesus referencing his father over and over and over and over and over and over right and you say well we know that pastor thank you for letting us know that are we going to get to our pies now are we ready to go and, and listen i would tell you i, I want to let you go but not before you understand what jesus was trying to relate to them and what we're trying to relate and work through today and that is that you have a father in heaven just like Jesus had a father in heaven. And that father loved Jesus and that father loves you. And Jesus is trying to let them know. They keep saying, well, show us, well, show us, well, show us. And Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. You say, oh, no, wait a minute, that's, that's past my pay grade. What does that mean? I would tell you everything about the father, his spirit was poured into Jesus. And because of that, listen, he humbly loved his father and as a result he gladly obeyed and everything you see from jesus is a reflection everybody say reflection it's a reflection of his father can you see that it's a reflection of his father <laughs> amen and i would just tell you a few things we're just going to go into this and then i want you to, to, to dig a little deeper with me the father listen to verse one last week we covered it. the father is not just a, a an absentee the father has a home amen everybody say father has a home and in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, the home is where? It's in heaven. And Jesus says, my, I'm going to go, and my father has a home, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you because there's room in my father's house for us, for you and I. Amen? Amen. So this is not somebody that's kind of like, hey, he's huge and, and kind of ethereal, and he's up there beyond the clouds somewhere, and I mean, he really doesn't have a lot to say to us. Jesus said he has everything to say to us. He's got a home and a room with your name on it. Amen. This is a little paraphrase, but it's pretty close. Amen? And I would just tell you, listen, there's something about that when some of us have got father wounds. Some of us even here today have got deep, deep father wounds. You're like, man, I'm over it. I, I did counseling for 30 days. I'm good. Listen, I need you to hear me. It's okay to have father wounds when you didn't do it. But I need you to hear me. It's not okay to hold on to them and stop and have a wall built up between you and your father in heaven. Because he didn't do some, some of your fathers did. Amen. And I would tell you, Jesus in this chapter is stapling this. And he's letting us know that, listen, the Father has, his, has poured his spirit out in him. I would say your Father's prepared you a place. I would say your Father, in the, from the very beginning of what we have in Genesis, at the very first thing, listen, the whole Bible suggests that our Father in heaven loves you and I. He loves his image-bearing creation. Amen? And some of you right now, it's like, yeah, 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 that sounds preachy, Pastor. Thank you for sharing that. Listen, the first time, I don't know about you, but if I created man and I gave them the whole world... Everybody say the whole world. Three of us. Amen. The whole world. 
was given to Adam and Eve. And in short order, we don't know exactly how long, but in short order, they sinned and rebelled against God. If you and I were in charge, would you be from that moment declaring that you were going to redeem them? Most of us would have to admit that our first thing would be like, wow, I thought this was going to go better than it did. I'm going to cut them loose. And instead, the Father booms out from heaven and lets the world, as it existed then, know that he already had a plan to redeem them. And I would tell you, from that point till today, the Father has still been pouring that same message out. Amen? The Father loves you and I, and the Father has a place for you and I. And listen, it gets better, and I just want to share this because this is important, right? <laughs> this is important. He, the, the, this chapter, even though we just covered, this is important. He says, he says he, he's providing a, a way of redemption and restoration. He's never going to leave us alone, right? He said that he would never orphan us. He, he's for us. He's not against us. It says he, he would do even one step more, and this is where it gets really powerful to me. He sent his son, and we always, again, we're all about Jesus here, so I, I make no apologies for that, but I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this really clear. The Father, Jesus, listen, he didn't just come on his own. Jesus came with the instruction of who? God. His Father. It says that, yes? Everything he did was done because it was at the instruction and the will of his Father. He said, don't, you're making much of what I'm saying. Everything I say came from my Father. Listen, I, if we don't catch anything else, I need you to hear this. The Father loves you. Our Father God in heaven loves you. And as a result, he has gone to great lengths. Everybody say great lengths. Great lengths. I can't imagine, and I'm just going to be honest. I shared this in a video not too long ago. I'm just going to tell you. I don't know who would sacrifice their own life for someone, much less their kid's life for someone that they didn't really care about. And I'm telling you, God loved you before you were you. And he sent his son literally to pay the only price that could be paid to make sure that you, that you could be saved and redeemed and adopted and ultimately spend eternity with him. That's the gospel, amen? That's the gospel. So you say, well, this is great, Pastor. We know this. Why are you sharing this? Because I would tell you there's a lot of us that we don't talk like we should, but there's a lot of us that have a very, very deep father wound. And others, even if it's not you, you have someone close to you, someone in your family, maybe it's your kids. There's others that you know that have got deep, deep father wounds. You say, well, that's great, Pastor. That's just a wound. We're all wounded somehow. Listen to me. When it comes to a father wound, statistically, you have a very difficult time loving and receiving and accepting God the Father as Father because of the wounds that are already in you. And I would tell you that this chapter, above most chapters, screams that the Father loves you. And here's what he's done, right? He's not only prepared a place, which is, which is great. Right? How many of you are looking forward to heaven? About half of us, amen. He's not only prepared a place in heaven, but he sent his son so that we could get there, right? He sent his son to pay the debt for our sins so that we could be redeemed and made right and restored, listen, and adopted into his family. So that, listen, so that for eternity, everybody say eternity. eternity. Right now you're thinking that's how long you're preaching today, Pastor. I get it. <laughs> listen, for eternity. How many of you know eternity is a long time? Eternity. And you know who he wants to spend eternity with? You and I. You and I. You and I. I want you to think about that for a second. You say, well, that's, I know God loves, love, God is love. We get that. Listen, if he didn't love you, he wouldn't have sent his son to go through all that he did for you and I. He did. And then, listen, there's, a, there's another piece of this, and he says it in this text. He says he doesn't just, and first of all, I'm just going to read you a couple things real quick because it's important you, you get this, right? John 4 We've already passed it, but it says God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Amen. John 1, previous to this, it said the spirit of God, it's his model. This is when we saw the, the baptism of Jesus. And we, we saw, it said the heavens opened up and the Father boomed from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? And then it said the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and rested on him. And, and the ESV and most of them, it says that he remained on him. And I would tell you that at this moment in Jesus' history, even though he was all God, he had become all man to do this. Everybody say all man. all man. He had become all man to do this. And as a result, at baptism, the Bible would paint that picture that the Holy Spirit of God, listen, the essence of God the Father, poured into and remained on Jesus. And it was from that point that all these miracles that fulfilled all the will of the Father became so clear and so evident. Amen? 
This is what you got to get a handle on. What did he do for Jesus? Jesus said, everything I'm speaking now came straight from who? His father. Everything he did that was going to glorify and make much of God was from his father. I'm going to take my glasses off. Is that not cool? Unless I break them. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So Jesus has got the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, remaining on him. And then he spends the next chunk of time. And everything he does, Jesus said, was straight from the Father. And everything he says is straight from the Father. And in the course of having the Holy Spirit baptize him, if you will, immerse him, right? Remain on him. Then we begin to see all these things that we read through the Gospels from Jesus. Amen? You say, well, that's, that's wonderful. What does that mean? Listen, we just read clearly in chapter 14 that the Father doesn't just have a place for you. He hasn't just prepared a place in heaven for you. That is for you. He hasn't just said that you failed. How many of you failed and sinned? Anybody here? Just three or four of us. Amen. He knew from the garden forward, and he made a way through sending his own son to come in the form of the Son of Man as the Son of God. And as a result, he was the only one that could pay for your sins in full. Yeah. So he loves you. He's preparing a place for you. And he sent the redeeming Lamb of God for you. And that's not where it stopped. Then it says, Jesus said, if you knew, if you believed, when I go, you'd be happier. Because for whatever reason, by the divine issue, the Holy Spirit rested on Jesus. And Jesus, because he was also the Son of Man, could only be in one place at one time. Amen? Everybody okay? I've lost you. Sorry. He could only be in one place at one time. Amen? Amen? By his choice. He was a creator. He could do what he wanted to. That's what he chose to do. As a result, when he went, he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask my father and he will send the advocate. He will send the comforter. He will send the helper. He will send the Holy Spirit of God. To who? Us. To us. Are you hearing me? Yeah, amen. So, so this, this is where I guess I'm, I'm going to lose some of you, but I want you to try. Here we go. Ready? Here's Jesus. Jesus came as the son of man, right? All God, but he According to Philippians, he, he set that aside, all the privilege he had, he set it aside to come for you and I. And then at his baptism, he's immersed. The Holy Spirit falls from heaven and rests upon him and remains on him. And from that point, we see him represent in word. We see him represent in deed. We see him represent in power. We see him represent in authority. We see his entire life make much of who? His father. Jesus said, here it is. I'm about to go home. I'll be preparing a place for you. I won't abandon you. I'll come back for you. But in the meantime, you'll be happy because I'm going to send my spirit. I'm going to ask my father to send the very same Holy Spirit that's in me to lay it out for all of you. Amen. And at that point, listen, what, you, what they could not do before that, you got to hear this. You, some of you right now, you read the, through the Gospels, you're like, you know, and, and Acts, and you're like, man, Peter, he must have been a stand-up dude. No. In fact, historically, we know he didn't make the first cut. Amen. If he was the first cut, he'd have had a rabbi he already worked under. Yeah. Instead, he was a fisherman. Those of us who love to fish, no, no foul. Amen. Right? These were not A-class, top-drawer people. And Jesus picked them. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Man, I look at that crop of the first 12, and I'm like, man, I, yeah. Some of us do. Some of us fit right there. And what he's saying is, is that the Father, he's going to go, when he goes to heaven, which he's already done now, he's going to ask the Father to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. And as we do, listen, as we have his Spirit remain on us, we can now speak the Father's Word. We can now teach the Father's Word. Listen, it gets better. We can now live the Father's Word. What was Jesus' life here? It was a testimony that was eternal. What is your life and mine with the Holy Spirit upon us? A testimony. And by his very design, it's supposed to be eternal. Amen. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. Some of you are like, man, I, I came for a happy Father's Day message. What is this? I need, you to, I need you to run with me here for just a minute. The Bible says in Colossians that Jesus, the Christ, is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus being gone, his Holy Spirit upon us. You know who is now the visible image of the invisible God? Every one of us. Every one of us. Is that convicting to anybody but me? You guys all got that down? 
here's the deal, and I'm going to try to hurry. I, I, need you to, I need you to grab a hold of this. this. This father wound stuff, and I'm not sure who it's for. I'm going to be honest. I, I prayed about this, and again, I'm, this is for you. I, I had an amazing father. I did. He's still amazing. I, if I, man, if I'm ever half the man he is, I'll be thrilled to death. I had an amazing dad. Again, largely not just because he loved me, but because he taught me to love Jesus. But for some, and I believe some even here today, for you to really rightfully fall in love with the Father, for you to welcome his spirit, listen, and his word and his testimony to be the main thing in your life, you've got to get past your father wounds. You need healing. You know where that healing comes from? Listen to me. You know where that healing comes from? It comes from the Father. I say again, you know where that healing comes from? It comes from the Father. Do you listen, this is big, man. I don't maybe it's just me and Brian. Is it me and you, brother? You get this? I'm telling you, I'm about to fall. Listen to me. I, I need you to get this. Man, this breaks my heart. I, so much of this early part of my adult life, I, I ran from God. Some of you need to know the Father better than you do. Some of us need to know the Father is a loving Father, a, a Father with healing in his, in his voice. Listen, we need to know Him better because our obstacles, the things that we've let, the hurts, the, the pains, the wounds, have stopped us from seeing God as a healing Father. And as a result, we run around and try to do church. We try to do our own thing. We try to figure it out. And we can't understand why we, we're still the victim and we're not victorious. Am I preaching to anybody today? I'm telling you, this is real in my life. And I need you to hear me this morning. I'm not trying to yell at you. I'm sorry, but I need you to hear. I need you to understand that the healing I lacked, the healing that some of us in this grass lacked, the healing that some of us online lack, it comes only from the Father. It comes from realizing that you've got a Father in heaven that loves you, has given His Son for you, has given His Spirit to you, has poured Himself out into you, has given you purpose and mission and a home that waits for you. He wants to be with you. His whole message of the Bible is He always wanted to be God with us. Amen. From the beginning to the end. And we run around saying, I love Jesus, sure enough, because I can't get away from that. And I, I love that I see the Holy Spirit working. That's great. But when you mention Father, I just can't go there. He's just some theory. And I need you to hear me. The healing you and I desperately need comes only from the Father. And you say, well, how do I do this? I would tell you, listen, the price has already been paid. You just listen. This is so good. Listen to me. You just got to stop running from him and start running to him. I say again, you got to stop running from him and start running to him. Amen. Here's a real quick thing, and I don't know if this applies to any of us, but this will maybe this will help make sense. I'm looking at the chaos. How many of you seen? How many of you watched the news in the last three months? Yeah. Four or five of us. Amen. <laughs> Next week, honesty. I'm telling you. Here's what I know. I know that when I look at the country that I now live in, it troubles my soul. Everybody okay with that? I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I don't care if you're standing in the middle of the aisle. I don't care. I'm telling you, this is a different world that we live in today than we live than I grew up in. Amen. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to get political. Some of you right now are like, got your chair in your hand. Like, he gets political, I'm out of here. Amen. I'm not going to get political right now. Wait for after the service for that. Here's the thing. I believe with all my heart, and this is just straight from the heart of God, as best I know, into my spirit. Listen, the majority of the people that have caused harm and pain and devastation and destruction and burned stuff down and crippled other people and killed other people and screamed and hollered and hurt the very people they were trying to defend. Listen to me. That's our world today, and I need you to hear me. The vast majority of those issues in people's lives can be tracked back to father wounds. Father wounds. And you say, man, pastor, that's an overstatement. That's just not true. Listen to me. Some of you right now are thinking, you know, pastor, you, th you think I got issues, but you think it's going to be. You can't blame my father. My father wasn't there. Listen to me. The empty chair in your house affected you huge. It affected you huge. Are we, are we okay? We're, we're talking real today? Here it is. And I'm going I'm to blow your mind right now, but this is okay. Take this home with you. We got folks out there that absolutely scream that they're atheists, that they know there's no God. I would tell you that a high percentage of those people, listen to me, they associate that there is no father at all because they had no father at all. And if their father was absolutely invisible, didn't exist, God doesn't exist. You following me? Those are atheists. Another group out there, they don't go by it, but that's what they are. They're, they're deists, right? They're deists. And I would tell you that they claim, they claim there probably is a God, but God is completely ignoring them. 
God has completely rejected them. He's, he put things in motion and he's no longer there. Listen, you, are you hearing where I'm going? They got father wounds, people. They've got in their life, that's what their father did. Are, are you tracking with me? Another group is, is agnostics. They, they, I refer to them as the absentee religion. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's the, they're pretty sure they can't explain science, so they know God probably created all this, and he probably put it all in motion, but then he's just completely absent. He, may, he basically just started the train and left. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Does that sound like dads in 2020? Showed up. I kind of know who he is. I, I probably met him a few times. Might have made a weekend or two, but at the end of the day, listen, he was completely absentee. They get grown, they begin to try to create a worldview for their own, something they can lock into, something they can believe, something they can hold on to. And imagine that. They've got a worldview that says God is absent. Here's some more. There's really, I'm just going to bring it a little closer, right? Rigid Reformed theology. Some of you might hit us right between the eyes. Rigid Reformed theology. And I would tell you that for a lot of folks that are, regardless of the denominations, regardless of the church organizations, rigid Reformed theology, listen, more often than not, it comes because their dads were home, but it wasn't a safe house when he was. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And as a result, when they think about their worldview, when they think about God, all they think about is obedience. All they think about is being beaten into submission. Amen? I could talk right here. Amen? I could. I need you to understand that there's a lot of us that we think our relationship with God is all about how well we did today. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You're honest, just raise your hand right now. You know what I'm talking about. Right? You wake up in the morning, you start humming kumbaya in the shower, you got your devotions out of the way. Hey, Jesus loves me today. My father loves me today because I did everything right. It's, well, it's almost 9 o'clock. We're good. Listen, this is the way a lot of us live. And I would tell you that a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it comes because of father wounds. Our relationship with our biological father has left us believing that God the Father in heaven is rigid, and stern and if we were being honest downright mean why is that what has he ever done to you or even that you know of him that would cause you to think he was unsafe for you you tracking last one here it is this cultural christianity right that's what i call it cultural christianity how many of you already know where i'm going cultural christianity it's, it's a new view of the, of, of the world, right? It's a new view of God. It's, it's literally saying that God is, he, he's, can I be, ever say, I love, I love Pastor Nate. Love Thank you. Amen. <laughs> he, he, this, the dad that, that is in that, right, cultural Christianity that we're fighting right now all over the country, that dad, for most of you, you're, you're assuming that the father in heaven is a lot like your bio dad was. And your bio dad, listen, he's the, he's the dad that was the cool dad. How many of you know what I'm talking about? When you need a beer for you and your buddies, he went out and bought it for you. He's the one that sit at home and get high with you. He just wanted you happy. Amen. He just wanted you happy. Whatever it took to make you happy, he was all that. Then you grow up and you become a Christian and you decide what? That your image of God has to look just like that. If, if there is a God, he wants me happy. And we don't open the Bible and we don't look to who the Father really is. And we've decided that that's all God. God exists to make me happy. You know how many churches are in our country today teaching that slop? Countless. Countless. Are, are you tracking with me this morning at all? Here's some of the fruit of that, right? Maybe this, I didn't break that mic, I'm sorry. Here's the fruit. Just real quick, there's a hundred fruits, but this is just helping, then we'll move on. Common symptoms of father wounds go like this. Fear of marriage and commitment. Do we have any, you reckon in our culture 2020, there's people growing into their adult lives and they fear commitment, and they fear marriage? Yes. Probably some other country, not ours. Another is chronic immaturity. Chronic immaturity. I don't even have to say anything, do I? Man, our culture is just eat up with it. Amen? We got kids, listen, we got kids that are 35, 40 years old. That's a joke. They still would rather be immature. They'd still rather play games in their grandparents' basement than to grow up than to be responsible, than to have purpose and mission for their life. Why? Because dad was gone. There was no father figure in their life to, to show them and help them and grow up and, and urge them to take steps forward and goals. And are you, are you tracking with me? I've offended a lot of women in the room. I'm sorry. Listen, some of you raised your kids on your own, and I need to tell you, I applaud you, sisters. I applaud you. It's hard to raise a kid with two parents. It's rough to raise them with one. Amen? I get it. 
But I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of our kids, they needed a dad. They needed a godly dad. Another is rebellion against authority. Man, I wish I hadn't said that. Amen. <laughs> right? Rebellion against authority, yes? Do we have some of that in our culture today? <laughs> Selfish, self-centered, entitlement. I don't even have to talk. Amen. And lastly, fiction over reality. We have entire generations of people that are literally, literally, <laughs> literally just, they'd rather play games. They'd rather live a life of a game. They'd rather stay high. They'd rather stay wasted. They will wait for the next party, right? I know we're not supposed to talk that way in church. We're not in church. Hello, we're outside. <laughs> Amen. Is it okay today for us to just talk straight? Is that okay? Some of you are like, Pastor, I, I'm risking myself being out here. And then you're making all these crude statements. Listen, I just, this will help you, right? We're almost done. Listen. I believe. And I believe that's why we have chapter 14 of John. I believe with all my heart that one of Satan's best tools. Everybody say, Satan's best tool. Okay, now we're going to say it together. Everybody say, Satan's best tool. Yeah. We'll come back to it. Amen. <laughs> Here it is. Satan's best tool, in my estimation, for 2020, for our generations that are present, is he has done everything he can do to wound you, to keep you from seeing who the Father really is. Amen. And I'm going to explain why that's such a powerful tool for him. If he can keep you hurt, if he can keep your, you blurred, if he can keep you from truly seeing how marvelous and awesome our Father in Heaven is, then we become real easy prey for him over the course of your life. Is that tracking? Yeah. Everybody, everybody follow? You say, well, man, that's a, that's a stretch, Pastor. How do you know? Listen, you know, you know, with my life, you know, whatever you think of me, that's okay. But, but I'm telling you, growing up, I grew up with a dad that loved me and protected me. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'll give you 50 stories that I was petrified until my dad showed up. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I've told the story, so I'm not going to bore you with it. But I'm telling you, when I was a kid, about 12 years old, they left me at home. My parents were not very far away, but they did some visitation in another family, probably some church thing. Amen. I was home because I was grown. I was 12. And, and we had somebody literally, while they were gone, try to break in our house. I mean, there was no mistake it. And I, and I called. Back then, we dialed. Sorry, kids. You wouldn't even know what that is, but we dialed. I had to never where they were at, and I dialed. Listen, as soon as I, got, I asked the, the person at the house, I said, this is Nate. Give me my dad. My dad came to the phone. He said, Nate, you know what we're doing? What's wrong? Is everything okay? I said, no, somebody's trying to kick the back door in. I'm telling you, dad, somebody's trying to break in. He said, I'll be right there. And he hung the phone up. I'm telling you, I was petrified. I don't even know what it is to be just scared. Me, me and two others. Amen. Okay. For the three of us, we'll finish the story. And I'm telling you, God is my witness. I was petrified. I'm like, this guy is trying to literally rip the lock off this door. I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it till my dad gets home. I hear him squall the tires making it into the back alley. I mean, I was our house in an alley. I heard him pull up, and I'm telling you, the minute I heard that squeal, I need you to know I became 10 foot tall and bulletproof. I started yelling through the door like, my dad's here now, buddy. Bring it. Whatever you think you got, you just bring it on in, right? Why? Because I had a dad that would give his life for me. Because I had a dad, listen, that was, man, he chewed nails. My dad was powerful. He was tough. Amen? I could trust my dad. Everybody say, I can trust my father. See, for some of you right now, that's hard to let come out of your mouth, isn't it? Listen to me. I knew I could trust my dad. So for me, it was a, it was a pretty easy transition when my dad began to point me not to himself, but to God. My dad didn't hurt me. My dad was always there. And he said, the only one that's going to be there longer than me is your father in heaven. Amen? But for so many of us, that's not our story, is it? For so many of us, Satan has kept that blur. He's kept us blinded. He's kept us wounded. And I would tell you, today's the day to break that free. Amen? Today's the day for healing. We good with that? Today's the day for healing. Amen. I'm just going to finish with this. I really wanted to preach four hours, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Mainly because I thought you'd all be gone. I'd be here by myself. I mean. Most of you, I'm not going to bore you with it. Most of you know the story of the prodigal in the Bible. The prodigal son. How many of you are familiar with the story? 
I won't, I won't go through the whole story. We don't have time this morning, but I'll tell you this much. I will tell you that I relate to that story really, really well. How many of you just be honest right now? Nobody looking around. You just relate to that story. You know what it is to betray God big and maybe a handful of us. Praise the Lord. Here's what I know about that story that I want to end with today. Because I think a lot of what I've just said, honestly, I'm just being honest. Maybe I'm wrong. In my spirit right now, I feel like about half of us. Maybe it's not that big, but there's a chunk of us. And it doesn't matter how many times I say we have a good, good father in heaven. It doesn't matter how many times I tell you that he loved you from the beginning before you were thought he loved you already. It doesn't matter how many times I tell you that if he was going to sacrifice his own son for you to pay your penalty and mine, man, how much love is that coming out of the father? It doesn't matter how many times I say it because, again, the wounds are so deep for some of us. The wounds are so deep that the very word, father, just gives you a cringe in your spirit. And I need you to hear me today. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear Jesus. We have a good, good Father in heaven. Amen. He loves you. He has, man. How many of you understand the word grace at all? Isn't that good? Man, I'm going to tell you what, when I was a kid, I'm going to be really honest, I didn't, I didn't know grace. Right? I was so spoiled as a kid. I mean, not like some, but you know what I mean? I, I just grew up believing, man, I, I was lovable. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You're like, Pastor, get over yourself. You're not that lovable. Amen. I just believed it. My parents loved me so. They, they took care of me. They protected me. They fed me. They, they were constantly investing in my life. Listen, I, I didn't understand what the rest of the world was when I got out in it. I can tell you for a fact, it's a whole lot uglier than I had at home. Amen. And the story of the prodigal is similar to that. He decides when he gets grown, in their culture, it would be like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want what's mine from your inheritance right now. And he took it. Dad gave it to him. And the Bible says he went off and he squandered it all away. And loose, crazy living. Amen? But I want you to hear, ignore the prodigal for a second. And I want you to picture in your heart the prodigal's father. Because that's the story. Right? We, we preach it. I preach it because I, I identify so well with the prodigal. Most of what I teach and preach is about the prodigal. But I need you to hear me. The whole story is about the father of the prodigal. Amen? And the Bible says when he came to his senses... He didn't come back and go, you know, I'm so spoiled. I know my dad will always be there. I'll, I'll come back in good graces. Everything will be fine. My dad will be fine. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he came to his senses and realized that though he did not any, no longer deserve to be called a son, so that wasn't even on the table. But if he could just go back and work as a hired hand, even a hired hand ate better than he was eating. Amen? And then the Bible paints this picture. And here's what I want you to get. The Bible says, I love this. I, we don't have time. I should, but today we'd be here a lot longer than I want to be. The Bible says as he's heading home, he's rehearsing. He's rehearsing what he's going to tell his dad. And he starts by saying, I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. How many of you can relate to that? Right? And he goes right down the list. He says, I know I'm no longer good to be your son. I get that, and I don't expect that. And I, I'm no longer even to be included in everything else. If you could just, if you're just room, you just hire me as a, as a hired, just a servant. And he's got these things he's rehearsing in his head. And the Bible says, when the Bible says when he was still a long ways off. I don't know, how many of you have been raised where you were raised on a long driveway? Anybody? <laughs> Handful of us? Right? I don't know how long your driveway was. I've seen some that were nearly here to Subway, amen? I don't know how far this driveway was or how long this was, but the Bible says while he was still walking toward home, still probably rehearsing his lines for his dad, hopefully nobody would kill him, hopefully the neighbors wouldn't catch him first, hopefully his dad wouldn't just have him shot, he's walking toward his dad, and the Bible says while he's still a long ways off, his father saw him, and he ran to him. The father ran to him, and he wrapped his arms around him and welcomed him home. I need you to hear me. That's the Father's heart for you. That's the Father's heart for you. Many of us have got this thing where we even rehearsing, man, what will we possibly say to the Father when we see him? I've heard people tell me, been in church 25 years, so I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus, but I don't know what to say to the Father. He'll be the one running to embrace you. He'll be the one welcoming you home. He'll be the one welcoming you home. I have never done anything in my life, not one single thing, including today, that ever deserved a father like that. But you know who has a father like that? This guy. 
You know who else has got a father like that? You. Is that making sense today? I know it's Father's Day and we're supposed to be primarily about our earthly fathers, but I'm telling you, I've been doing this a while. And every time I get to this day, I'll talk about good dads and dads that love you and dads that care and dads that, that teach you about Jesus. And I'll have about 20% of our congregation say, amen, pastor, my dad, your dad, that's right. And then I've got about 80% of my congregation that won't talk to me when we walk out. They're not mad at me. They're just mad. Amen? They're just mad. Because the word father to them represents hurt, damage, pain. For some, it's abuse. For a lot of them, it's abandoned. Amen? Maybe that's you. I'm here to tell you. What I'm supposed to tell you today is not to, hey, brush that off. Don't you hate that when you were a kid playing ball? You remember? You fall and you hurt yourself. First thing the coach says, just dust that off. You're fine. Right? Just shake it off. How many of you heard that term? Shake it off. Most of us. Amen. Right? I, now I've coached a little bit, so I, and I've played a little. So I get it. You don't want your kid out there just bawling because they're hurt. Amen? But I'm not here today to tell you to shake it off. You know why? Because for some of us, the pain is so great. The damage is so deep. I wouldn't even dare say shake it off. But here's what I will tell you. I will tell you that you have a Father in Heaven that loves you. And I will tell you He has proven it a hundred times over. I say again, He has proven His love for you a hundred times over. Your Father, your bio Father may have hurt you. Your Father in Heaven will never hurt you. Your bio Father may have abused you. Maybe. Your Father in Heaven will never, ever abuse you. Your Father, listen, your bio Father may have literally abandoned you when you needed Him the most. I promise you, your Father in Heaven will never abandon you. Man, I have, we laugh in our house talking about our guardian angels. We're like on our third or fourth one, right? I don't know. I don't have any Bible to back that up, but I'm just saying, right? We laugh about it because it's incredible what the Father will do to, to keep His arms wrapped around you. Your father will never let you down. Some of you right now are Bible scholars. You're thinking, yeah, well, what about Stephen in the Bible? Peter stands up and preaches the gospel for the first time, and thousands come to know Christ. Stephen gets up and preaches that same gospel with the same fervor, and they stone him to death. You think I forgot that part? Ready for my answer? The Bible said that when Stephen was being stoned, he was about to breathe his last. The Bible said he looked up, heaven opened up, and Jesus stood up to welcome him home. I'm telling you, the Father never abandoned Stephen. The Father never abandoned Stephen. The Father welcomed him home. Paul, on the other hand, then Saul. Paul, on the other hand, gets to live a whole bunch of years being beat up and stoned and imprisoned and hurt. All for the glory of God. You say, Pastor, what are you saying? I'm getting dizzy. Which one? And I'm telling you, it's all for his glory because he's all there for you. Amen? He will never abandon you. He will never abuse you. He will never forsake you. That's good news for somebody. Is it you? Will you bow your heads with me? I don't want to drag this out, but I, I want us to, to take just a minute. Because I really do believe, and I was praying early this morning by myself. I was praying early this morning for this very service, and I was praying in particular for you. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna admit it. In my heart, I was broken. And I didn't have a name, I didn't have faces. God didn't tell me was well, these ten or these twelve or these two. He didn't say that. But he made it crystal, crystal clear. Crystal clear that there would be people in this, in this gathering that have father wounds so deep they can't see him. They have father wounds so deep they can't, they can't reach for him. The healing, listen, the healing they need, they can't reach for him. Because every time they think about a father, they think about their bio father. I believe we've been gathered for a reason this morning. And maybe the biggest thing is for me to tell you, like Jesus told them, that you have a good, good father. You have a father that adores you. You have a father that adores you. 
I say all the time in, in our house, listen, he, he doesn't just have a picture of you. I've heard that forever, right? He, he loves you so much. If you're his, he, he's got a picture of you on his refrigerator. I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to tell you, not only does he have a picture of you on his refrigerator, you have been given refrigerator rights. You have access in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Listen, if you're here this morning and anything I've shared has begun to open up your heart, anything I've shared this morning has begun to touch you in a way that you realize, man, maybe my view of the Father has been off. Maybe I've let hurts and wounds and things in the way that I... I need to reach to the Father. I need to know Him that way. I need to know Him that way. I need to go to Him that way. I need to quit running from Him. And I need to run to Him for the healing that only He can provide. If that's you this morning, right where you are, nobody looking around, I want to pray with you and for you. We just slip up your hand and say, Preacher, you're talking right at me. Amen. Hallelujah. Are there others this morning? Let's keep them up. No one's looking around. Anyone else this morning? Amen. Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Man, we're going to pray right now. But you know what? More important than any word that will come out of my mouth. Jesus, they came to Jesus. They said, how do we pray, Jesus? How do we pray? And this was the first thing he said. He said, here's how you pray. Address my father as your father. You start by saying, our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are awesome in your mind because of what Jesus has done for me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, right now I lift these up that have been so honest today to say we struggle with the wounds and the hurts and the pains and the disappointments and the wrong that's been either done to us or wrongs we've done. Listen, I, I love that this, to this week, right now, you've made clear to me that the, the path, listen, is not just a path to the cross. The path we've got to clear is to you. The path we've got to clear is to our Father in heaven. It comes to the cross, but he's, man, in all the red letters, he tried so hard to point us to you. Today, Lord, we pray and we pour ourselves out. We come running to you instead of running from you. I pray right now, Lord, for your deepest healing in the hearts of these that have, have raised hands. These, these people, man, there's probably people here that didn't raise a hand. They're still struggling with these wounds that are so deep. I pray, God, that your grace, just like you, reached into my life and so many here this morning. I pray you would do that today for them. I pray that we wouldn't even leave this yard without it becoming just crystal clear who you are, that we would get a real clear picture of you in our hearts, and that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt we've got a great, great Father in heaven that loves us. Lord, may we lean into you for healing. May we lean into you for your word, for your mission, for your purpose, for our life. May our life be a beacon of hope because we know the Father and we're loved by the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.